What if I were to tell you that there is a city in America with a population of over 1 million people and an economy of over $100 billion, but it has minimal cultural relevance, sprawl like no tomorrow, and a light rail network so bad, its last mayor proposed tearing the tracks out of the ground. You'd probably call it a disaster of biblical proportions. And if you had to guess, you'd probably guess it's Houston. You'd be wrong. Let me introduce you to the lost opportunity of a city, San Jose, California, and where it went wrong. Before doing a deep dive, we should do some general history, because San Jose is so out of the national consciousness, I imagine you know next to nothing about it. San Jose exists at the southern end of the San Francisco Bay Area in Northern California, popularly called the South Bay for obvious reasons. It was inhabited by the timing group of the Ohlone people, the indigenous people of much of the Bay Area, for thousands of years before Spaniards arrived in the mid-1700s and claimed it. As part of New Spain, San Jose was founded in 1777 as a strategic point on El Camino Real, or the Royal Road, and as a site for Spain's growing missionary network. Jumping ahead a bit, after Mexico's independence, Mexico enacted a policy of land grants on the theory that giving away large swaths of land to ranchers and farmers would help protect their frontier and to secularize land taken from the missions. Fifteen of these land grants lie within the present-day boundaries of San Jose. San Jose quickly developed from cattle ranching to fruit trees, becoming among the largest fruit-growing regions on Earth, thanks to its mild climate. That's right, San Jose and the Silicon Valley occupy land that is considered some of the most agriculturally productive land in the world. I wonder if they plan to build a dense walkable city to help grow the city's wealth while protecting these incredibly valuable farmlands. Spoiler alert, they didn't. A little manifest destiny and a hundred years later, it's the 1940s. During the Second World War, companies like IBM and various defense contractors moved to San Jose and laid the groundwork for San Jose's prominence in the tech sector. After the Second World War, San Jose City Council elected a city planner named Anthony P. Hammond, commonly called Dutch. Despite his name, he was neither from the Netherlands, nor did he take any inspiration from European city planning. While most sources use the term pro-growth to define his term in office from 1950 to 1969, nice, a more modern term would be referring to him as pro-sprawl. He worked heavily to annex neighboring towns and make San Jose bigger, which when paired with the Federal Highway Act of 1956 and FHA housing policy, basically just built a giant suburb with half a million people up from just 100,000 at the start of his tenure. His argument for his policies was a desire to make San Jose the regional city of the South Bay and avoid a situation where the South Bay had several competing cities. Because reasons? While he largely succeeded, it was not without consequences, and with various expansions unpaid, he was kicked out in 1969. San Jose today faces the consequences of being such a large, wealthy city that has historically been planned as a large suburb where much of the city is dominated by single-family homes and a disproportionately small downtown. With the growth of the semiconductor industry came white-collar workers who preferred This led to the city and county government going all-in on single-family housing developments and lots of freeways. It's somewhat ironic that the city that started the innovative Silicon Valley when IBM first opened a facility in downtown San Jose in 1943 has such abundant wealth but is burdened with the dual problems of an identity crisis as a city and a massive affordability crisis. The reason I would argue San Jose is, if not the worst planned city in America, at least the most squandered opportunity, is because it went all in on being a giant suburb at the cost of actually being a city. Let me present to the court Exhibit A, San Jose as seen from Google Earth. This is unbelievably bad. You can see how tiny its downtown is since it's been sliced by freeways on all sides. It's crisscrossed with elevated freeways with little sense of direction. This insane amount of freeway real estate gives way to insane amounts of parking, which in turn prevents the type of denser, mixed-use development that is the norm in most of the world, or even a lot of major U.S. cities, and replaces it with asphalt, asphalt that pays no rent, no taxes, creates next to zero jobs, and creates literal divides between neighborhoods. This makes a city, for lack of a better word, one giant blob unable to form a more defined city characteristics like Philadelphia, Chicago, or even its neighbors Oakland and San Francisco. For the record, I'm not saying San Jose should look like Barcelona or Utrecht, but I think that the fact that the city has only made tepid discussions on evolving, and has made very limited efforts to become more pedestrian or bike friendly, is disappointing given how wealthy the city is. My Exhibit B is a San Jose Wikipedia article collage. Wikipedia's attempt to show the most important parts of San Jose. It consists mostly of historic hotels, 
I visited San Jose dozens of times in my life, and I don't recognize any of these minus one. Santana Row, a very wealthy mixed-use development built in the 2000s. Which, going off just the buildings, is pretty generic mixed-use. Man, we suck at mixed-use in the U.S. so bad, we call building apartments on top of shops a luxury. That means that on that tiny sliver of the remaining 6% are mixed-use places like the Santana Row from earlier, which due to the principles of supply and demand, end up prohibitively expensive. This overall ends up reinforcing the idea that mixed-use, walkable neighborhoods are only for the rich or people in other countries, when in reality, the problem is overwhelmingly a question of zoning, causing supply constraints, because when you subtract all the single-family housing, roads, and freeways, the amount of area San Jose has for shops and businesses is very tiny. This artificially creates scarcity and drives up the costs for both housing and businesses, which is great in boom years, but when you go bust, you get hit hard. We normally think of NIMBYs as people against anything in their backyard, but San Jose somehow got infected with a bad case of NIM, not in my downtown. Despite allowing for many city annexations and lots of new housing and freeways, the city seemingly decided at random to spend almost 50 years fighting its own downtown. This has led to an extremely underwhelming downtown for what is allegedly the 10th biggest city in America and the largest in the Northern California. This goes all the way back to our friend A.B. Hammond, who annexed unincorporated county land to help IBM move out of downtown, on top of bulldozing historic buildings in the 1960s and weirdly putting their city hall away from downtown until 2005. To give context for how underwhelming San Jose's downtown is, let's go on a Google Maps walking tour starting from Dridian Station, one of the main transit hubs of San Jose. In the future, it will have stops for both BART and California High Speed Rail, and currently connects to multiple transit systems. The first thing you'll notice is, there's very little around it beyond parking lots, and I honestly wonder how they plan to handle all the traffic from BART and High Speed Rail. Is everyone just supposed to drive here? You can walk a couple blocks and make it to the SAP Center, home of the San Jose Sharks, making a right down Santa Clara Boulevard. So far, we are more or less following the future path of BART. The only thing of note so far is, another freeway overpass. Let's ignore that and push through. Clearly a much denser area, and I recognize some names on these towers, so we must be in downtown. But so far, I don't see any place I'd actually want to go to. After 14 minutes of walking, we find a fell place called Duck Fu. The first non-hotel bar restaurant. Forgive me for the pronunciation. As we keep going, I can't help but notice there's no bike lanes. And where do these buses even stop? The only physical bus stop I could find, not just a painted pole, is one in front of a dentist. 20 minute walk from Druidian Station. On the more positive side, we just passed the VTA light rail stop. We'll get to the horrors of those later. We're finally at the big payoff. Look familiar? It's City Hall, and we just walked from one future bus stop to the next. Did that look like the core of a city with a million people to you? My point in showing you this exercise is that, without good walkability, good bike infrastructure, and reliable buses, Instead of San Jose building a fleshed out transportation system through BART, high speed rail, electrified Caltrain, H train, and VTA light rail, we might just end up with lots of transit, but nowhere to go. I'm not saying San Jose doesn't have attractions, but because of its sprawl, it's really hard to find a day trip itinerary without a car, even factoring future transit. If someone wants to throw me ideas in the comments, I'll take a look and report back. There are so many examples of public transportation transforming cities, but it feels like San Jose isn't taking the right steps to take this golden opportunity to make something of it. For perspective, the Sonetown Mall in San Francisco, adjacent to one light rail line, is converting most of its parking lots into housing over the next decade, and a model I think a lot of malls near any transit should look into. I don't see anything in San Jose trying this despite there being ample opportunity, with three existing light rails and the aforementioned BART line in the future. I hope I'm just wrong in the seven years when BART is projected to open are farther than I imagine, and I'm proven wrong and we just see a ton of transit-oriented developments pop up at the end of the decade. This downtown problem has led to probably the most bizarre aspect of San Jose's horrendous planning, its black hole of cultural relevance. Before going into this topic, I want to be very clear, San Jose is home to a diverse population of people who bring their own cultures. And I know plenty of great people from San Jose. This is nothing against any individuals living in San Jose who can only imagine bring as much to the table as any other city in America, if not more honestly. As a whole, however, because the city is one giant bedroom community, the people of San Jose are severely handicapped in creating almost any impact on America's, or even California's, popular culture. Sure, some companies are based there, but the most famous one is said to be further up the peninsula, and I don't know if Facebook slash Meta counts as part of California's culture. The one colossal exception is the band Smash Mouth being from there, 
In fact, you will find in any list of things San Jose is known for. To frame this in YouTube terms, the only videos related to San Jose I could find with more than 250,000 views were either about the San Jose Sharks, the only professional sports team that plays within the city of San Jose, and this one video from Feed Mei Mei. In San Jose's defense, Feed Mei Mei, a Bay Area food vlogger, is a GOAT content machine. This leads me to the biggest disappointment I have with San Jose, its light rail system. The VTA, or the Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority Light Rail, began operation in 1987 after the success of second generation light rail systems, such as the much better planned San Diego Trolley, which has an order of magnitude more ridership, despite also being a three-line light rail network in a similarly sized sprawly city. I cannot stress this enough. This isn't one of those, oh look how this city in America or its hat does worse than this village in Europe kind of situation. This is Freedom Apple to Freedom Apple comparison, San Jose built among the worst light rail networks in America, and by extension the planet. Largely because the city threw a lot of money building a network but doing the worst type of zoning around stations. Its last mayor wanted to tear out the tracks and replace the system with buses, which would have made San Jose the biggest city to remove its train network since GM ripped out all the streetcar networks in America through the 40s and 50s. We really are going full circle. To put hard figures to it, the VTA light rail system had a combined 26,700 daily weekday riders Q4 of 2019. Almost exactly the same figures as the M line of San Francisco's Muni Metro. Its system wide ridership was even comparable to some bus lines in San Francisco and was beaten individually by the A, C, E, and L lines of the LA Metro, a city famous for its high transit usage. And comparing it to present day numbers are so bad, it's easily at the bottom of COVID recovery. It's also worth noting it is unbelievably slow and has at times been described as running at a crawl due to a lack of signal priority and virtually nothing separating it from car traffic or pedestrians. Despite all of this, I don't actually think the problem is the light rail system. I mean, it kind of is because they probably should have started with a BRT, but nobody in America knew about those in the 1980s. The real culprit is the way San Jose was planned, even if frequency and other issues were fixed. Building a sustainable ridership model for VTA light rail is just not possible because there aren't enough people living within walking distance compelled not to drive because everything is so spread out. On top of this, the VTA faces a rough maintenance backlog, so it's kind of a vicious cycle at this point. You might be asking at this point, okay, great, this city is kind of mid, but how would you fix San Jose? Great question. I'd honestly say just build densely along transit stops and try more upzoning and creating more walkable neighborhoods. San Jose could easily convert streets to be more bike friendly thanks to its many already wide roads and flat topography. Currently, the projected bike lane infrastructure is trashy at best, with only a handful of streets having anything I'd consider human friendly. Several recent state laws sort of forced cities in California to move this way, so hopefully I'm just preaching the illegally inevitable. San Jose also just became the biggest city in the United States to remove parking minimums, so even as I record this, things are changing. Unfortunately, last year was also the worst year for pedestrians in San Jose, so hard to be too optimistic. Additionally, the city is getting a three-stop subway line thanks to BART and high-speed rail. I would hope they use that as a focal point for improving the city by upzoning those areas and trying to attract more destinations, as well as increase walkability. Maybe I'm missing something, but it generally comes across like the city doesn't realize that they are paying $9 billion for a new subway and a stop on the California high-speed rail network. Like, what does the average person do once they get off the train? How does the average San Joseian get from their car-centric neighborhoods to these fancy new trains? I don't see any obvious answers. I want to end this video by saying, I don't hate San Jose. I'm actually a little hopeful, but also very confused. I'm just saying, maybe we shouldn't have built almost exclusively detached single-family homes in the place with very agriculturally productive land and great climate and by the ocean, and flat, and in the middle of a giant job nexus where tons of people would want to live. Despite being a global leader in tech innovation, it is currently falling behind in the realm of innovative, human-centric city planning, and I challenge it to do better. Thanks for watching.